Hello everyone and welcome back to this nanophotonics and plasmonics course. Now that we've introduced the concept of localized surface plasmon resonance uh, and then we've seen that uh, those plasmonic nanoparticles can be used as optical nano antennas to uh, enhance some type of photophysical effects. Uh, we're going to focus on the specific case of uh, optical spectroscopies where uh, the optical emission be enhanced by the presence uh, of plasmonic nanoparticles. Let's uh, first uh, highlight two key challenges uh, that remain for, uh, for potential applications. Uh, the first one is that optical nonlinear processes are typically very weak, especially in intensity, and that basically leads to uh, very poor application potential. Now, uh, the second, uh, second aspect that uh, we're going to basically highlight here is the ability to detect and identify single molecules or at least very small amount of certain type of chemical compounds um, uh, for various type of uh, applications. So the, there's of course an interest in, in security uh, with the detection of um, small amount of explosives or toxins, uh, drug residues as well. Uh, medical uh, field has also uh, a lot of to gain from uh, the detection of small amount of molecules, especially in pharmaceutical applications with the detection of chiral molecules where certain type of chiralities are good for uh, drugs, uh, but uh, the opposite chirality actually can, can kill you. So it's very important to be able to sort out the chirality of molecules. Uh, we're going to see also as an example uh, the detection of hormones for pregnancy tests. Uh, food and environment safety uh, can also benefit from there uh, with the detection of pesticides or dairy products, uh, water contaminants in general or heavy metals. But also, for instance, the the, the field of cultural heritage. So uh, museums are now using more and more uh, optical spectroscopy techniques to really detect and identify uh, certain type of organic colorants in paintings or in, uh, in, uh, in pottery uh, and other artifacts to trace back the origin of, uh, of the, the different uh, art pieces. So local stress plasma resonance they exhi exhibit a very large spectral tunability. That's something we've seen already in chapter nine. Uh, and also exhibit a very large local electric field enhancement. Both of these properties are going to be used in different ways uh, toward optical spectroscopies and, uh, and sensing applications. So the spectral tunability, for instance, with respect to the dielectric environment, that's something we discussed extensively, uh, will be used for sensing applications and um, specifically in, uh, in terms of biosensing. And that's what we're going to be calling um, LSPR sensing. Uh, the second uh, property, which is the strong localized electric field, uh, will be basically used uh, to enhance optical spectroscopy signals. Uh, and these are just uh, some of the examples of optical spectroscopies that benefit uh, from the presence of localized surface plasmons. So we can name surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy or surface enhanced infrared absorption, second harmonic generation, photoluminescence and so on and so forth. So they're very much all the, the optical uh, spectroscopy techniques that you, you can think of can benefit from the presence of local surface plasmons to enhance the, their optical signal. This particular uh, chapter, we're gonna focus on the case of Raman spectroscopy in particular. So uh, before we dive into uh, the particular case of Raman spectroscopy, it is important to, uh, to recall some of the basic concept of optical processes in terms of light matter interaction. So if you, uh, if you study light matter interaction on a very basic uh, fundamental level, you can describe this, uh, this type of uh, optical processes using quantum, uh, quantum mechanics uh, and in particular perturbation theory. So if you look at the first order of the perturbation theory or the quantum uh, mechanical framework, uh, you're basically descri uh, describing only propagation of a photon uh, in free space, with, uh, which has a certain energy and a certain uh, momentum. Now, the first order uh, of this uh, light matter interaction process uh, has been described by Fermi. It's basically just the, the absorption of a photon. Uh, so once the photon with certain energy and momentum is being absorbed by matter, uh, then basically you just generate electron and holes. Uh, basically you have conver con conversion uh, of uh, a photon into an electron or pair. So you have uh, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Now you, you can also do the complementary process. So you have basically the emission of light 
from the recombination of electrons and holes. So this is basically an energy diagram showing this process uh, for the first order. So you have the, the absorption, so you have an electron being promoted from a ground state to an excited state. That's going to be basically the, the absorption process. Or if you have an, an electron which is basically uh, present on an excited state and it's going to relax to the ground state and it's going to emit a photon during the transitions. The second order, uh, which is the elastic uh, scattering uh, or Rayleigh scattering, so basically you have the absorption of a photon gives, giving rise to uh, electron ore pairs and those electron ore pairs will recombine giving rise to a scattered photon. So the, the photon which is being scattered has the same energy as the incident photon uh, but that's just a different momentum. Uh, so this is the, the uh, energy diagram for this process. Uh, so you have an electron moving upward to a, a given excited state. That's basically a non-radiative transition from this excited state to a different excited state at the same energy. And then you have the emission uh, of a photon when the, uh, the electron basically relaxes back to the, the ground state. Now the process that we are, we're going to be focusing on right now, which is the, called the, the Raman scattering, is an inel inelastic light scattering process. So the, the photon uh, incident light is being absorbed by the material, giving rise to electron ore pairs. But now uh, the electron basically now lose energy or gain additional energy by the emission or the, the absorption of a vibration. This electron that will basically be promoted all the way th up there is going to lose energy non-radiatively. So transfer of energy from the electron to the surrounding uh, environment in, in the form of uh, vibrations uh, and then once the this electron has either gained or lost energy it will recombine with the hole and uh, basically give rise to the emission of uh, scattered light and this scattered photon has basically uh, an energy which is different than the incident uh, photon and the difference in energy is basically the energy of the vibration uh, either the phonon if you're in a, in a, in a material or the just the molecular vibration if you're in a molecule. And then basically, of course, you are, you're gonna have uh, a different, uh, different momentum. So this is the scattering effect. So now you see that this is a third order uh, process, optical process, so this is uh, highly nonlinear. Uh, so by definition, this process is very weak. So um, what is SIRS? Uh, so the surface enhanced Raman sp uh, scattering is a very powerful uh, vibrational spectroscopy technique uh, and basically it allows you to, to really uh, obtain highly sensitive uh, detection of, uh, of uh, vibrations and st structural uh, information on the molecules or analytes in general and you can really go to very low concentrations uh, as opposed to regular Raman scattering because as, you, as I just mentioned Raman scattering is a very weak process so if you have a low amount of molecules that you want to detect, for instance, uh, using uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, you will not be able to get any useful signal. So we're gonna need to increase the, the concentration to get something uh, usable. So uh, how this works, basically just use the, uh, the strong localized electric field uh, generated by the excitation of broadcast phase plasma resonance. So if you have uh, sending light on a molecule, this molecule is gonna start vibrating uh, and you're detecting light uh, with a different scattered energy uh, as a result of this uh, energy uh, being uh, transferred into the, uh, the vibration of the molecule and you're basically going to record the Raman spectrum uh, with those different peaks that are the signatures of the, the vibrations of the different uh, chemical bonds in this particular molecule. So and that's basically going to give you a, a, a very clear signature, unique signature of that molecule. Uh, now, as I said, this is something very weak and you need a large amount of uh, molecule to actually be able to get something which is usable. Now, if you place a plasmodic nanoparticle and you excite this with the low classified plasma resonance frequency, uh, uh, you're going to basically have the molecule sitting in the strong electromagnetic field and then you're going to obtain a Raman spectrum or surge spectrum that's going to be much more enhanced as opposed to a regular Raman spectrum. So the process is the same, you send light in at a given frequency, you detect light out with a different frequency, you just take the difference between those two and then basically you obtain a, a Raman spectrum uh, if you have only the molecules or if you have the molecules and the plasmonic uh, nanoparticles around and you have the source spectrum. So let's uh, discuss a little bit about 
um, where this uh, source comes from, who discovered it, and uh, what's the origin of, uh, of this, uh, this, this mechanism. So in 1973, Martin Fletchman uh, performed some uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy measurement on pyridine on uh, silver electrodes, and he observed a very strong uh, enhancement of the, the Raman signal as opposed to uh, just the molecule dispersed in, uh, in the solvent. Uh, so he, could, he didn't understand what was going on, just observed this, uh, this enhancement and uh, realized that there was something going on. Four years later, uh, two groups uh, working independently uh, realized that the concentration of those molecules uh, on the surface of the electrodes could not be responsible uh, for the, the enhancement of the signal that uh, Feichmann was actually observing. Uh, and they independently proposed two different mechanisms uh, to account for this, uh, this, uh, this enhancement. So the first enhancement uh, mechanism proposed uh, was by uh, Rick, Rick Van Dyne at Northwestern University, and I had the pleasure to, to work with, uh, with Rick before he passed away uh, a few years ago. Uh, and what he proposed at that time in 1977 was that, that there was an electromagnetic effect that was occurring at the surface of the, the silver electrode. The second enhancement mechanism that was proposed by Creighton uh, and his colleagues uh, was basically just a, a charge transfer effect. So there was a chemical mechanism, uh, which was basically just a charge transfer between the molecule and uh, the, the metallic electrode. Uh, so it, it, it happens to be that both mechanisms are actually true. Uh, both mechanic mechanisms exist, uh, but the electromagnetic effect proposed by Van Dyne uh, is actually the dominant mechanism as opposed to Creighton's uh, mechanism uh, of charge transfer effect. So we're going to discuss both uh, in, a, in a minute. Why, why the controversy of SIRS? Uh, simply because well, the, the first observation of the SIRS effect itself was 73 by Matthew Fletchman, but uh, there's been a lot of disputes between Fletchman and, and Van Dyne, who both claim paternity uh, for the SIRS, uh, Van Dyne claiming that uh, what Fletchman, Fletchman was uh, was observing, he didn't even know what he was observing. He observed something and he didn't explain it. While Van Dyne was the one who actually brought the explanation uh, and the underlying uh, physical effect, explaining SIRS. Uh, so there's uh, there's been, uh, of course, a lot of debate uh, and controversies uh, over the years, uh, ever since the, the discovery of the plasmons. So I leave you with the facts. Uh, then it's up to you to decide uh, who is the, the, the true father uh, of SIRS. Um, so what's the, 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 the physics behind? So the, the surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is just a, a different version of Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so in Raman spectroscopy, the total power which is being scattered uh, in your experiments is going to be given by, of course, the, the number of scatter or the number of molecules you have. So the more molecules you have, the more scatter, the more scattering, the more signal. Uh, it's going to, of course, depend on the type of molecule uh, through their uh, scattering cross section. So very similar to a regular scattering cross section for gold nanoparticle uh, that we've introduced uh, in chapter uh, chapter nine. Uh, molecules have also uh, a scattering cross section. So this is a Raman scattering cross section. And it's going to, of course, depend on how much light you send to excite the, the molecules. SIRS is fairly similar, uh, so it depends on the number of molecules. It's going to depend on uh, scattering cross-section, but now we see that we have a different uh, cross-section. So this is the Raman cross-section, and this is the SIRS cross-section. Uh, it's going to depend also on the incident uh, intensity of light. And now you have this, uh, this factor F. Uh, which is basically the electromagnetic enhancement factor that we're going to discuss on the next slide. So something I want to, uh, you to notice also is that uh, you have uh, these different scattering cross-section. Uh, and basically, because you place the molecule near a plasmonic substrate or a plasmonic nanoparticle, this molecule will, uh, will basically uh, see a change in the environment. Uh, and because you're going to change the environment of the molecule, it's going to basically scatter light uh, and it's going to behave differently. So this is reflected in a change uh, from this uh, sigma RS to this sigma SIRS. Uh, notice that uh, this change, uh, because of the local environment, is basically reflecting directly the, chemi the chemical 
uh, contribution of the source enhancement. So this is the basically reflecting the the, the mechanism proposed by Creighton, but uh, this uh, electron uh, transfer between the molecule and uh, the plasmic substrate. So the the chemical enhancement is contained inside this new scattering uh, cross section, while the electromagnetic enhancement uh, due to the plasmons we're gonna see it's contained in this factor F, in this enhancement factor. So what this uh, enhancement factor is, uh, well, basically the electromagnetic enhancement mechanism uh, proposed by Van Dyne uh, is driven by the presence of the localized surface plasmon resonance, uh, which basically enhances the local electromagnetic field at the surface of the metal. So in the case of the original um, experiments by Fleischmann in 1973, uh, this metallic surface was the, the silver electrode. So because we have a silver electrode, those electrodes are much, much larger than the, uh, the size of the molecule. So they are basically kind of considered as flat surfaces. So they were basically using uh, surface plasmon polaritons rather than LSPs. So this enhancement factor, uh, this F that we introduced uh, before, uh, that's gonna dictate how much uh, Raman signal is being scattered by the molecules in the presence of a uh, plasmonic neural structure is basically given by the uh, electromagnetic field, the electric field intensity uh, at the incident frequency and uh, times the electric field intensity uh, at the scattered frequency. Uh, so now that basically we are looking at the, how much the local electric field is enhanced by the local plus plasma with respect to the incident uh, excitation. Now, because the, the frequency of the, those, more, those vibrational motions is very small compared to the incident optical frequency, uh, looking at uh, something of the order of mid electron volts as opposed to something which is of the electron volt, uh, then we can really assume that the enhancement factor is really uh, proportional to the fourth power of the local electric field enhancement due to the local surface plasma. So this is the, the field enhancement due to localized first plasma resonance and then you take that to the power four so this power four i see it's pretty big uh, and if you put put in uh, numbers uh, for a, a plasmonic nanoparticle uh, if you perform uh, any, any computational simulations like fdtd or fem or whatever you can reach an enhancement factors of basically fourth power of local electric field of the order of 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 11th so basically, uh, theoretically, you could enhance the, the Raman signal by that much uh, in the presence of gold uh, or silver nanoparticle. Now, experimentally, there are uh, additional effects that uh, comes in, but experimentally, people have been able to achieve uh, 10 to the eighth uh, as a source enhancement factor. So basically, you're, you're able to enhance uh, regular Raman spectroscopy signals uh, by a factor of 10 to the eighth. Uh, if you compare to uh, to chemical the chemical enhancement factor, uh, which is basically the ratio between the the source and the regular Raman uh, cross sections, is basically just ten to the three. So you see that the electromagnetic uh, uh, enhancement mechanism proposed by Van Dyne is uh, much much uh, stronger than the the chemical or charge transfer mechanism proposed by Creighton.